There has been a lot of buzz in the past few years about UFOs and the U.S. government. More than usual. Now, if you've listened to Lore and Legends for very long, you've probably noticed that I sort of pepper aliens throughout many of my episodes, and I have another podcast I help with called Skinwalker Radio, where we focus on this kind of stuff in particular. So what do you make of the whole UFO scene? Are there aliens visiting or residing on the Earth? Is it all misidentified man-made stuff? Is it a massive hoax? Or are you kind of an all-of-the-above person? Well, the New York Times made some waves recently in a short article published July 23rd by Leslie Keene and Ralph Blumenthal titled, No Longer in the Shadows, Pentagon's UFO Unit Will Make Some Findings Public. In the article, we learn that the Office of Naval Intelligence has had people assigned to UFO cases, which shouldn't really be that surprising. Some of the most popularized cases of all time involved the fairly recent USS Nimitz and the USS Roosevelt sightings, and I have even personally spoke to some of the witnesses on Skinwalker Radio, which I'll link to at loreandlegends.net. Now, their stories are compelling, and they imply that someone or some group in government knows more about the incidents than they're letting on. Senator Marco Rubio, the current acting chair of the Senate Intel Committee, raises the fear that these advanced craft belong to a foreign country with potentially harmful intentions. But several members of the predecessor program, known as the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, don't seem to be on board with the foreign nation angle. In particular is Lou Elizondo, the alleged head of this program, who has appeared on the History Channel, Fox News, and a plethora of online outlets hinting towards otherworldly involvement. And a man named Eric Davis, who is very prominent in the UFO community, is also mentioned and hints toward recovered UFO materials. So for this episode, I wanted to highlight Eric Davis a little bit and flesh out where I think that hint about crash retrieval in the New York Times article is headed. So who is this guy? Eric Davis, or should I say Dr. Eric Davis, received a PhD in astrophysics from the University of Arizona in 1991. He is also an adjunct professor in Early Universe, Cosmology, and Strings Group at the Center for Astrophysics, Space Physics, and Engineering Research at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. So now for some of the more interesting bits. Dr. Davis also worked for Robert Bigelow's National Institute for Discovery Science, or NIDS for short, in the 1990s to the early 2000s. Yes, the Robert Bigelow of Bigelow Aerospace and Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies, and yes, NIDS was the group that investigated the anomalies at the infamous Skinwalker Ranch in Utah that was the subject of the book The Hunt for the Skinwalker, written by George Knapp and Colm Kelleher. Dr. Davis was the physicist of that group. The events and claims made at Skinwalker Ranch seem to have at minimum helped push towards the ATIP program getting funded in the early 2000s, for which Robert Bigelow was the primary beneficiary. In fact, one of the Freedom of Information Act documents that we do have access to lists a series of reports called DIRDs, or Defense Intelligence Reference Documents. I'll link to these at loreandlegends.net, but they have some pretty crazy titles, things like Anti-Gravity for Aerospace Applications, Traversable wormholes, stargates, and negative energy. Concepts for extracting energy from the quantum vacuum. Laser light craft and nanosatellites. Now, by the way, all those titles I just mentioned list Dr. Eric Davis as the source. But while we're discussing ATIP in the context of Dr. Davis, I'll also point out another title, Advanced Space Propulsion Based on Vacuum, Space-Time Metric Engineering, by Dr. Hal Putoff of EarthTech International. Note, that's the same company Eric Davis is listed with as working for. And yes, this is the same Hal Putoff of Remote Viewing and Project Stargate fame, which I did a recent podcast on some Stargate stuff. And Earth Tech International is in fact Hal Putoff's company. So, right away we're into some strange territory. And as you can hopefully see by now, Dr. Davis has some interesting connections to the land of government secrecy and woo. So, What about the alleged crash retrieval hint in the New York Times? 
I think Dr. Davis quite possibly or likely was referring to the implications of a memo that is associated with him, referred to broadly as the Wilson Davis Notes, or the Admiral Wilson Leak, which I'll link to at laurenlegends.net. It's a memo of an alleged conversation that he had in the back of a car with an Admiral Thomas Wilson, who was the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency at the time in October of 2002. The conversation starts with Wilson acknowledging some conversations and meetings held at the Pentagon that involved the former Apollo astronaut and sixth man to walk on the moon, Edgar Mitchell, Commander Will Miller of the United States Navy, and notable ufologist Stephen Greer. They discuss Roswell, an alleged organization called Majestic 12, and crashed UFOs and alien bodies. Also mentioned is a story written in the Boston Globe by none other than Leslie Keene, the author of the recent New York Times article. So in this memo, there's some back and forth, and several more interesting names get mentioned, but the crux of the memo is that Admiral Wilson says he found the super-secret UFO retrieval program. He demanded access to the program for purposes of oversight, as would be the job of the director of the DIA, but even being at the top of the food chain, Wilson says he was denied access. Wilson goes on to say that he met in person with three representatives of the program who discussed the secrecy and a near-outing incident that occurred over a similar demand for oversight and auditing, and as a result, the group controlling the project was given the ability to deny or allow at their discretion. The group seemed to be entirely civilian and was off-limits to even the upper echelons of government, and that even includes presidents. Wilson manages to get them to tell him that it is a reverse engineering program, but that's about as far as he gets. So after being shot down, Wilson says he returns to Washington and he calls a meeting to review the situation in which he is again rebuffed. We learn that the government does sustain the project, but that the project is still off limits. The other nugget Wilson drops a little further in is that UFOs are real, but that the abduction stories are not. So after the interview winds down, Wilson says he wants to stop talking, and has probably said too much. So for sure, go to loreandlegends.net and check out the document for yourself, and I'll also list a few other awesome sources, and of course you should do your own searching as well. But in a nutshell, what might we have here? We might have a very high-ranking government official acknowledging that a UFO, or the remains of at least one UFO, are in fact in the possession of the United States of America, behind the closed doors of a private defense company that is attempting to reverse-engineer the technology. So, if I were to guess, I would think that Lockheed Martin would be the best candidate for the defense company in possession of the craft, if there's any truth to it. Lockheed is also one of the benefactors of the ATIP funding, and if this memo is true, it's implied that the government did still manage to get money to this clandestine program. So, who makes all the fighter planes that we buy anymore? A lot of the missiles and a lot of the electronics. Lockheed Martin. I think we'll be hearing more about this story in the near future, but I would also like to point out that there are some problems with some of the things in this document. And again, laurenlegends.net for some links that go deeper, but things like Majestic 12 may well be total fakes, and Mr. Greer has his own checkered history. One must also realize that Ed Mitchell was a UFO guy. He wanted to believe, and his status as a moonwalker carried, and still carries, some clout. Unfortunately, though, Mitchell's no longer alive to ask about any of this, and if you read it yourself, you'll catch that the two authors mentioned in the beginning of the exchange are the authors of the recent New York Times article. Is disclosure right around the corner? Or does the UFO thing seem like a lot of inside baseball with a lot of the same recurring characters? Thomas Wilson, of course, denies the memo, just like the memo claims he would. Eric Davis works for companies that get government contracts, and there's no shortage of TV and radio shows that pay or get paid for stories on the topic. Where there's a market for a product, someone is sure to come along and produce. But just as I'm thinking I've wrapped this little short episode up, the New York Times goes and produces another article. This one is titled, Do We Believe in UFOs? That's the Wrong Question. Again, LaurenLegends.net, I'll link to it. But the article here sees the authors of the previous article responding to the question, do you believe in UFOs? To which they respond at first that it's kind of an offensive position, as writers like to maintain the illusion of no biases, which I think is kind of telling. And they follow it with, 
they don't believe in UFOs, because UFOs are a fact. And of course, unidentified flying objects do exist, but they sort of skirt around the implication here, and the implication is aliens. I don't think anybody would really care too much about the UFO, it just turned out to be another airplane. Well then they state that basically what I discussed above, that some people with clearances believe, now there's that word again, believe, crashes have happened, but that any recovery is of course out of bounds, so no one knows. And now you're right back where we started, but you're doubling down on the Wilson memo being real. It's funny to me that the subject of UFOs gets caught up in belief so often especially when I see so many threads pointing back to the same cast of characters who can never really prove anything, but they want you to trust them. But for more on this, you really should go check out Skinwalker Radio. We've got a lot of interviews from eyewitnesses to some of the crazy events at Skinwalker Ranch, the Nimitz UFOs, and there's even the hardcore skeptic Mick West. He's on there. So, go check out loreandlegends.net for more rabbit holes you can go down on this UFO Wilson Davis memo subject and there will be a link to that in the episode description. But that's all I had for this. See you next time. The music for this episode. Phantom from Space by Kevin McLeod, available at filmmusic.io, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0, and Graveyard Shift, also by Kevin McLeod, from filmmusic.io, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0.